Hey, what's up everybody? Chad here from Grayscale Gorilla, and these are my first impressions for the new node-based material editor in R20. So R20 has just been announced, and with it, tons of new features. In this video, I'm gonna give you my first impressions on the new node-based material editor, give you a quick tour, and show you some of my favorite things. Let's jump in. Um, first and foremost, I think to get this out of the way, the number one question that everybody has been asking me is, will it work with third-party rendering? Will it work with Octane, Arnold, Redshift, yada, yada, yada? Not right now. I've been told that it's still in progress, the new node-based material editor is still in progress. So it's going to need to solidify itself before they can open it up to these third-party renders because you wouldn't want them you know, developing all sorts of stuff and then they change the entire structure and it screws everybody up. So um, as soon as it's finalized, they will, I've been told, uh, open that up to the third-party renderers, and we will be able to start using this in Arnold and Redshift. I'm not sure about Octane. They've got their own, so I'm not sure where that's going to land. But yeah, so that's why I'm excited, because not necessarily that I'm going to like use physical uh, all the time. I do use physical sometimes, but I'm excited about what this is going to be, and that's really why I'm, I'm jazzed about this, because it's really fun. Okay, so... Um, right off the bat, I'm just going to show you a couple things. Uh, if you go down to the materials and you say create, uh, you're going to notice down here we have um, we have a couple of options that were not here before. You have your same old like new material, PBR material, all that sort of thing. But now you have new node material and new Uber material. So what I've been finding myself doing is going to one of these top two. Now down here you have all sorts of presets. They're getting cut off by the stream. But they've gone ahead and made some pretty decent presets here that you can start with. And you can really learn how it works this way too. So if you want to grab a car paint, you could actually dive into this car paint and understand how it works. But for this demo, we're going to keep it really simple. Now the Uber material is what you are used to as far as like a normal physical material with reflectance. It's got everything built. They basically built it from all the pieces, put it back together and formed this Uber material for you. Now that's a great material, but I want to start with the node material because it's it's a bit more of a, of a base level material. So let's just grab a new node material. I'm just going to double click it and boom, we are in the new node interface in R20. This interface is really great. It's super snappy, it's really intuitive, and it looks and feels just, it just feels great. It, after coming from material editing in Expresso, this is a huge, huge upgrade. So I'm gonna give you a real brief tour. Um, so obviously you've got your top menus, you've got everything up here, we'll go over that stuff maybe if we have time. Uh, Generally speaking, though, it's pretty simple to navigate. You got your zoom scroll wheel. You got your uh, middle mouse click to sort of navigate. This little window down here allows you to sort of navigate a very large scene. So if this is like up here somewhere, you can see I can just move this over here and find those nodes again. So it's it's a really intuitive interface. It's got your previews at the top, which uh, you can see these little sort of half checker patterns right here. You can turn these on and off. So you can see what you're doing at any point in your in your material, which is great. They also have the, uh, the swatches over here updating, which uh, we'll get into that in a minute. There's some good things about that and, and some not so good things. But right now, um, just giving you a brief tour. Uh, the other thing that I really like is the ability to search for assets. Now, if you've used um, Redshift or Arnold, you know how important it is to be able to search for uh, a node that you want to bring in. So you've got this whole ability here to search. You can like search checkerboard. And let's just do that. And then we can just drag that right in and you got yourself a checkerboard. So that's super important. Down here, you've got your info of anything that you have selected. It's going to tell you exactly what it is that, you're, that, you're, that you've got uh, selected. The other thing that's really interesting too is up here, you've got this like little viewport uh, letting you know what is what's inside your node-based material right now. You can see it's got your diffuse and it's got your material. So what, why this is important and why I really like this is because if you've got a really complex shader, and let's say you're looking at you know something way down here, maybe you've got this checkerboard piped into the I don't know piped into the the color. Let's say, and we'll get into the piping in a minute. 
And what's great is like if you just want to continue to work on this guy right here, but you want to select your maybe your diffuse, you don't have to like navigate over here and find it. You can literally just come over here and double click or just not even click, single click uh, that diffuse node right here. So all your nodes are listed here. Not only are they listed here, but you can search here. So you can say, you know, I only want to see my checkerboards. So you can like list out all your checkerboards. It's just really intuitive. And I really, I love that. I think they really took a lot of time to make this a very intuitive and sort of pleasant thing to work in. And I'm in the material editor a lot. I spend the majority of my time in Cinema 4D in Expresso right now because I'm using a lot of Redshift and Arnold. I can't wait to get into here and start doing materials. Um, you also have the ability to, if I select a node, there's a lot of right-click uh, contextual stuff. So if I right-click here, I can add inputs, I can add outputs, I can show my preview, hide my preview, change my layouts. Uh, this is kind of cool. So your ports here, you can kind of work like this, which is showing um, no, only the connected ports, I believe. Oh, no, all ports. Uh, or you can say, I only want to show the connected ports. In our case, we don't have anything connected but the output, so it's just going to show you that. Or we can say, hide all ports, and it gives you a much more streamlined look. And if you hide the little preview, you can get an even more streamlined look. Another thing that I've been finding myself doing a lot is using the layout all, which is fantastic. If you're like me and you tend to be sort of messy and you throw stuff around and your textures just start getting all hairy, this layout all is fantastic. It lays out everything really, really well. I think it's super like, I don't know, I haven't found any situations yet. I haven't pushed it to the really far limits, but I haven't found any situations yet where it's not able to clean it up and make it look intuitive. Uh, what's What else do I like? Oh, I love the snap to grid. Of course, you got to have that snap to grid so you can really clean up everything and make sure everything's really pretty and you can find your stuff and, and just kind of work your way through the flow. Um, moving my way down here, you can also do these uh, these these panels, the same things that I was doing over here with the right click. You can all, also do that in the top, which I kind of I kind of tend to use it in here. I don't know why. It's just more of like an intuitive way to work for me. Um, the other thing that you can do is group things. Now I'm not going to get too far into that yet. We'll probably cover that a little bit more in a minute. But I just want to give you a quick tour. You can group nodes. So if let's say I don't know, we wanted to grab a checkerboard that was feeding, and I'm just gonna, oh yeah, let us let me show you this, this is pretty rad. Um, so, the dragging and connecting is so good. Uh, let's just grab a color. Oh, and in case you're wondering, um, one thing that I love about working in, in Arnold is the ability to uh, have a contextual uh, quick search in my Expresso, and I think I have it in Arnold, I have it set to control tab. So I went ahead and did the same thing in our 20s node editor too, and you can do it just by, let me see, oh yeah, right here, the nodes commander it's called. And so if I bring up the nodes commander, it's a quick search, so I can type in checkerboard, hit enter, and boom. So I could do that again, boom, checker, if I could spell, boom, hit enter, and it draws the node. That alone will make you work like 30 times, 30% 30 faster, 40% faster, depending on your workflow. For me, it I mean, it's insane. It helps a lot. So you can just type in anything in here. You can start to search for conversion nodes, generator nodes, colors. So you can see I grabbed a color. And we're going to connect this to our uh, checkerboard. So you could just like, you know, drag the noodle out over uh, the checkerboard, hit release, and then it'll give you the options. Okay, well, what do you want to connect this to? And I can just say color one. Or if I don't want to do that, I think what I can do is just delete this guy. I'm just going to, you cut all, I could have done that a couple different ways. Let me connect that again. So I can grab the no, the noodle and hit delete, and it's going to delete that, that port, or it should. Uh, yeah, it took a minute. Or if you want, you can go uh, and connect it and then show your show your ports and just sort of like pull it off, oops, pull it off that way. So it's super intuitive and it's very, there's a lot of different ways to work um, with it, which is great for me. Uh, so let's go ahead and connect this out to color one. There we go. Maybe we'll copy and paste this and grab a different color. Let's just grab, oh, and the new the new gradients are amazing too. I'll show you that. Well, I won't, I won't show you those. I'll save those for a different time. Uh, let's put this into color two. Let's go ahead and hide all those ports. 
And now those are all connected in there. We're gonna make this into a group really quickly here. So with these selected, I can come up here and say group like this and just hit this little group button. And instantly it's put into uh, one node, which cleans up your, your flow tremendously. Um, and you can easily get back into that, that just by hitting that arrow and then just navigating over. So what this does is now it allows us to work it compartmentalizes our shader a little bit, so we can work. We can work a little bit more cleanly. We're not so um, messy, or it's not as intimidating to look at a giant flow if you've grouped some things together. Uh, what's also great is you can always just come back into this uh, this like little hierarchy mode here. So I can look at that group, or I can come back into the main node. Um, and again, I can just dive in there just like that, and I can get back out just by clicking up here. It's great. And then the other, uh, another interesting thing too that I just discovered this morning actually, uh, is this little button, I'm not, I think it's called, oh, it's history, okay. So what history does is it's gonna, it's gonna remember where you've been. Uh, if you've had another shader, maybe you looked at this car paint shader and you open this history up, you, it's going to remember the nodes that you were in recently. So this is handy if you don't want to dive back into your material lister and select something. You can just go into this history and say, oh, I was working with node 2. Let's grab that. All right, cool. So that is um, a brief overview of, uh, of, that, of that sort of grouping. Now, over here on the right, you've got your, your tabs, your view tabs here, which could do a lot of different things. Let's go back into the uh, node group. Nope, this one. I want to go into... Come on, go back into node. There we go. Whoa, weird. It's like popping. Let's go ahead and make sure that we did that right. Again, this is still in beta. So, all right, so there's our group and there's our thing. Okay, so if you notice over here, we've got these tabs here. Um, one thing that I noticed is that the preview sometimes will take a little while because this, I believe, is a progressive render. So if you have a complex material, this material preview right here can take a bit of time. So usually what I've been doing lately is just working without it. So I usually work with the inputs and I'm holding down control and holding down and I'm, I'm selecting, uh, sorry, shift and and kind of multi-selecting these tabs so I can choose what I want to look at here. I'm not looking at the preview. I don't really need that right now. I'm used to not working that way anyway because I do a lot of third-party rendering, so it's not something that we're normally able to see. So this is where you're going to be able to edit all of the settings. Now, you've seen in other videos people talking about these squircles. Now, these squircles are these little guys right here. So the squircles are essentially just connections. They're node connections. They're the same uh, node connections that you see over here, but they're just shown to you in a more, uh, I guess, a, a typical sort of C4D way. Uh, so you can connect things this way too. In fact, we could, um, let's just kill that and we're just gonna grab another checker and grab that checkerboard. And I am going to connect this to the color, but this time I'm gonna grab that checkerboard and go to the squircle. And in the color one, I am going to select, mm, let's grab a, what do we wanna put in here? You could put anything in here. Um, I typically work with the search because sometimes I just don't remember where things are. So let's just grab something simple here. And let's do a, I don't know, complex noise, I guess. So now we're driving uh, color one with a complex noise. And you can see, um, you can work with the squircles that way, though typically I'm probably nine times out of 10 gonna be opening up my little, uh, what do they call it again? The node commander, the node commander. Sounds very official. So for me, I would probably describe a noise like this and just do it that way. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's crazy fast and it looks great. I just, yeah, I really like it. Um, also, uh, you can do things like, I believe you can search for noise. Yeah. Okay. This is great too. So this like little filter, this little filter search down here up here is really cool. So what that allows you to do is it allows you to quickly sort of contextualize, uh, any particular node that you want to see right now. I just typed in NOI. So it made the noise, um, stand out and everything else sort of grayed out. Now I'm not really sure. I'll have to do more research on whether or not there'll be a feature where it'll lock these out completely. Uh, but that is kind of a cool feature. Um, let's see, what else have I missed? Oh, there's so many things. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Oh, I guess it's important to show you to like, you know, let's build something, right? I guess that makes sense. Uh, I think for this, I'm gonna tab this down here. And so this will be a little bit easier for us to work. And let's grab a new material. So we're gonna grab a new node material. And let's grab that one, double click it, and let's jump in here. Okay, so 
This new known material is like a stripped down uh, physical reflectance material. You can see over here on the left, we don't have, um, we've got a connection for the surface and we've got multiple layers of BSDF. Uh, anybody in the chat that knows what that stands for, I'll give you a huge thumbs up if you get it. Uh, if you don't know what it stands for, I believe it stands for bidirectional scattering diffuse. Oh God, I got to cheat. Uh, yes, defunction, so bidirectional scattering diffuse function. It's a fancy way of saying, how do you want to define this surface? Because it can be diffuse, it could be reflective, it could be dielectric, it could be, be a conductor. Uh, how do you want to define that surface property? So right now I've got just a basic diffuse BSDF in here. So it's a, it's kind of like working with a flat Lambertian sort of shader. Um, now we can layer this up just like if in physical, we can layer reflectance, but reflectance is now, I believe it's called, if I change this to a GGX, I believe they now call it reflection and not reflectance, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'd have to check the Uber shader, but anyway, let's undo and get back to where we were. Cool. So you can layer things up. In fact, we could just come over here and grab another BSDF. BSDF. Oop, that's my. That's not it. That's my uh, my little nodes that I have. BSDF. Now I easily could have done this with, with my node commander as well. Uh, okay, so let's change this BSDF into uh, a GGX reflection. Uh, we'll change its Fresnel to dielectric, and we'll leave it at like a plastic. And now we come over to our main material, and we just add another input, another BSDF layer, and let's just drag that right into the BSDF layer. And because it's all um, it's all basically physically uh, plausible, and it's going to add that reflection right on top of that diffuse perfectly, we have a nice plastic. And you can see how quickly you can start to layer these things up, and it becomes really intuitive to build a really complex shader. Uh, let's um, let's go ahead and uh, see what do we want to do. Oh yeah, I wanted to show you one of my absolute favorite things um, about this workflow. Okay, so let's just grab a simple cube and let's make it like I don't know, 50 by 50 by 50, and let's put it right in the middle. Um, and I just have some really simple render settings going, nothing crazy. I'm using uh, physical and really low quality settings so that it goes pretty quickly. Uh, let's go ahead and assign that material to that object and dive back in. All right, so we want, I want to show you one of my favorite things, which is these new UV transforms and UV distortion uh, features in R20. So let's grab a simple texture and oops, not that one. Uh, almost gave away some uh, some some stuff there. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into. Okay, let's grab. Uh, oops, not in there. What's in here? Okay, we're gonna grab this simple UV grid, and you can just drag any texture right into your node editor, and it's gonna load it right in as a node. So give it a second, um, unless it died. Uh, come on. Load it in. What are you doing? And load it in. This worked a second ago, folks. It's beta. You got to give it a minute. That's super weird. Um, okay, well, let's just make sure that... All right, well, that didn't work, so let's try this again. Let's grab a uh, new node material. Double-click it. Open that up. We're going to drag our UV in there. Okay, that time it worked. Not sure why it didn't work before. Let's go ahead and assign that material to our cube. I'm gonna go ahead and tab that right in there. Perfect, all right, now we've got something. That should work. I'm sure it'll be uh, ironed out by the time everything goes live. Um, okay, so we've got a simple UV grid, and I'm gonna pipe this out to the color channel so that you can see what we're dealing with here. Um, couldn't be any simpler. It's very, very uh, intuitive um, as far as like dragging in tex texture, putting in the color, good to go. Um, one thing that I really like is the ability uh, in node-based materials to publish any material, any node that you're on, uh, out to the viewport. Now, in Arnold, that is um, by I think it's uh, pu pushing it out to the to the surface. I believe in Redshift, it's the view. Oh man, I get them all mixed up. Anyway, publishing whatever you're working on out to the viewer is a huge part of what I do every day. 
So you notice here, there's a little S button right here. Now this S button is only gonna make sense if I grab one more, just to give you a little bit of something here. So this S button is like a solo. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I should probably actually learn what that stands for. I'm just picturing it being solo because that's what makes sense in my head. And if I'm wrong, somebody call me out. But for me, this is really important to uh, visualize what I'm working on very quickly and easily by saying, oh, you know what? I don't need to see this entire shader. I just need to see this one node that I'm working on. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a noise, maybe it's a checkerboard, whatever it is. So what I've done, is I've hot I've made I've given it a hotkey so that I can easily publish that out to uh, the viewport. And I'm gonna see if I can figure out what that they're calling it. Oh yeah, here we go. Set solo. I was right. It was solo. Set solo node port. So that S right there. If I click it, it's not really gonna look that much different because we're already looking at this UV texture right now. But if I come down to this checkerboard and I hit the S, it doesn't even have to be assigned anywhere in my material, and I can see that texture in my viewport and in uh, my little, my render region. This is really important for when you're working on a complex material and you just wanna see one little part of it to see how it's gonna react down the line. So I've given that a hotkey. I've made mine uh, shift control C, I believe. So I can just, I can just like select any node and look at it in the output right there. Now I'm looking at the entire shader. Now maybe I just wanna look at the checkerboard and now I'm gonna come back to the UV grid. Very, very handy. So glad they implemented that feature. That is a, a huge part of what I do every time I'm working in materials. Um, across the board, I would say there is so many things and so many nodes that you can explore in here. There's contextual nodes, there's conversion nodes, generators, info material. It can be overwhelming. I recommend... Um, probably just glancing through these. Not necessarily, you don't need to know what all of these do, but a general rule of thumb when you're working with node-based materials is sort of in your mind, imagine what you want to do and then do a search for it. For instance, if you wanted to add uh, this checkerboard texture to this uh, texture here using like an additive mode, I would say, well, let's grab that texture and let's hit add, what, what shows up? Well, blend shows up, let me hit enter. And immediately you're given a blend with the blend mode set to add. Now that's that's completely uh, that's doing that based on my search. So if I hit multiply, it knows that I want to do a multiply instead of an add. Now that's pretty rad. That's actually really really rad. Save you a lot of time. So if you just type add, boom, blend. Let's put this in the foreground, this in the background. Pipe this out to the color and you're good. So now we've got that texture. If we wanna just look at this texture, let's hit that shortcut for the uh, uh, output to the viewport, and boom, there you go. Very, very simple. Um, now, before, uh, before I go on any further, I need to set up a really simple idea here, and we're just gonna do something. I'm just gonna build something really quickly here. We're gonna grab a cloner, and let's throw this cube into our cloner and we'll make this a grid array and we'll just back the camera off quite a bit here so we can see. Okay, so let's say um, you've got this clone array of cubes and let's get rid of this guy and we don't need this blend anymore. Oh, also what's great too is like if you noticed I was able to d delete a uh, node that was connecting in or that was living in between these two nodes and it just reconnects it for you. It's those little things like that that I love, I love that. I love the fact that I didn't have to, that didn't break the connection, I didn't have to reconnect that back to the color. Um, the UV transforms are so good in here now that I'm a bit jealous that there's not as many options like this in some of the third party renders that I use. So what do I mean by the UV transforms, UV offset? You may have seen some of these videos and I'm just gonna grab one. You may have seen um, a few videos where people are doing some stuff with the UV distorter. So what the UV distorter allows you to do is it allows you to distort your textures, UVs, without having uh, to jump into, um, you know, you don't have to go into Photoshop and warp them and do anything weird. You could do that all right here with this UV distorter. So if I put this UV distorter result and I just drag it over my texture and let go, it's going to want to connect it to the context input. So now what, I'm, what I can do is I can feed in any sort of information or 
texture, ramp, whatever, into the distortion or into the strength of this UV distorter node, and I'm going to get a really cool result. And in fact, let's just do that real quick. Grab a ramp and, oops, I mean a gradient. They all, they all call them something different. Uh, let's grab that gradient and go like this. And let's make our gradient, uh, we're going to use a, hmm, let's do a circle. And let's put that right into the distortion. And you're going to see right away, right in here, we're getting a really cool distortion on that texture. And hopefully it'll show up here. So you can see what I mean. Uh, you m heard me mention before that sometimes there's a little bit of a lag. And I think that has to do with this preview that's happening over here. But uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but yeah, now we've got this really cool distorted texture. So if we wanted to, I don't know, flip this, maybe uh, invert these, invert this gradient and do sort of like a, maybe something not quite as, as intense, maybe something more like this. Uh, that's probably going to be, come on. See, it hangs a little bit right there. And I'll get into that. I'll get into that <laughs> when I talk about the things that I wish were a little bit better. Uh, all right, so let's see. Let's do something like that. All right, so it'll be just a real subtle uh, distortion on that texture. That's really cool. Being able to do that is really powerful. Being able to layer it up, maybe throw a noise in here. I'm uh, just hitting my commander. And double-click that and grab our noise, and we can grab this noise and drive our direction that way. Or we could have the, no the noise drive the strength, too. We could actually leave this connected. This node here could be driving our direction, and then we could use the noise to drive the strength. So now we're going to get um, a slightly different result because it's still going to have that, that little bit of distortion, but we're using the noise to drive the actual strength. Super cool stuff. Um, okay, let's do something a little bit more like, I guess, typical use case. Now, um, the way I use UV transforms in third-party rendering is to offset textures randomly across different clones. That's a huge, uh, it's a huge, uh, I guess, time saver and a great workflow if you're trying to create really complex looking scenes without having to create tons and tons of shaders. So the idea here is that we would have a material, one material, with a, with a texture, and that texture is going to be offset, because it's probably tileable, it's going to be offset uh, randomly across all these different clones. There's a bunch of ways that you can do that now. So let's get rid of the UV distorter, because we're actually not going to use that one for this. Uh, we're going to use, uh, actually I think I'm also going to turn off my, uh, I'm going to turn off my render region, because I think it'll go a little bit faster. I'm not sure if we really even need it. Okay, so we want to randomly offset the position of this texture across all of these different clones. How do we do that? Well, there's there's actually a lot of ways you can do that. So I guess like if I was coming at this for the first time, I might say something like, well, maybe I need like MoGraph. Oh, cool, there's a MoGraph node still. Let's grab that. All right, so it looks like I can grab a color, I can grab UV, and I can grab index. All right, that's good. That'll help me. Um, how would I do that? Okay, well, I would grab a cloner, I might grab a effector random, and in this case, we're going to say parameter is not going to be position, it's going to be color, and we're going to use the alpha strength, and we're going to drive into that uh, color is going to be default. Yep, good. Okay, we want to make sure that our maximum is going to be 100, and our minimum will be zero. And let's go ahead and actually bring our render region back for this. Actually, let's delete this color and throw this into the color. And let's see. Okay, let's see what I'm doing wrong here. Oh, that's got to be black. I believe the random maximum zero. Yep. Uh, oh, um, no, that should be right. I don't know why I'm not seeing the color there. Let's see, let's grab a interactive render region and just make sure, okay, we are seeing it, it's just not showing up in the viewport, which is a little bit weird. Um, that's fine, we can just work this way. All right, so now we're getting some random colors. This is starting to seem, okay, this seems, this seems correct. Now what we wanna do is actually take this texture, find a UV, 
uh, transform. So we've got this UV transform, and we know that this is how we're going to transform this texture. So let's just go ahead and grab this result, drag it over that, and say, oh, well, I guess it goes into context. Okay, that makes sense. This result is going to go into the color, so that makes sense. Now, the UV transform has local offset, length, rotation, all this stuff. So what we want to probably drive is going to be our offset. So right now we have, if I solo our MoGraph, we can see that we've got some color data here, but we need to change this into uh, a value that's going to drive the local offset, in which case this is going to be percentage. There's a bunch of different ways that we could do that. We could convert that, we could do a bunch of cool stuff, but I'm going to do the easiest way because we don't have a whole lot of time. So I'm going to grab my uh, node commander and I'm going to type in range mapper. And we're going to connect this right into a range mapper. And let's go ahead and look at the output of that range mapper, hitting my node commander, uh, or sorry, hitting my shortcut for the thing that I can never remember the name of, which is set solo. And now we've converted this into values. Uh, this is what we want. Now we can just come over here and say, well, I know this local offset is expecting a percentage. So let's give it, uh, and I know that this will one will equal 100%. So let's make this output of 1.5 for output max, min zero is fine. And let's just dump this result right into the local offset. And let's see what we get. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the, we're gonna look at this node. So let's go ahead and just solo set that one. And boom, there you go, we've got completely randomly offset, and actually we don't need, technically we don't, yeah, I guess we do need the render region because it is happening at render time. So now we've got this ability to offset these textures randomly. This is great if you're doing like wood planks or concrete pavers and you wanna sort of mix it up and get an idea and make it look a little bit more natural. Let's go ahead and hit that that auto align. I love that, love that. Look how clean that is, that's great. It's so, so nice. Uh, okay, so we've done that, and now what I want to show you is a different way that you could create a little bit of randomization. And I'm going to do more videos on this uh, as we get closer to the release. So this is just a just a really quick taste of what's possible. All right, we did that with MoGraph, so now we can come in here if we wanted to grab that random effector. We could also drive these with fields. We could do all sorts of crazy stuff with the new fields. Let's just change the seed a few times, and let's maybe change our, our, our output max to maybe 200. So now they'll be offset even more. And uh, let's create a rotation, a random rotation on these as well. So we could do that with a MoGraph again, but I don't know, that's, that's a, it's a bit limiting. I want to control like exactly what's going to happen with the rotation of these textures. So let's grab a multi-shader. The multi-shader is super cool. The multi-shader is gonna allow you to add inputs and, and basically uh, randomize colors, randomize values, randomize all kinds of stuff. There's random mode, there's color mode, iterate mode, UV mode. What we're gonna mess with is random mode. So random mode is gonna select one of these three colors or inputs. I could put completely different shaders in here if I wanted to, completely different textures. Right now I'm gonna use it for colors because right now I'm gonna use it to drive the rotation of this texture. So I'm gonna quickly come over to my green and make that white, this blue is going to be black, and then this middle one I'm going to make uh, gray, so it's going to be 50%. All right, boom, oops, 50% uh, in value. There we go. So now we have white, and we have gray, and we have black. So we have zero, we have 0.5, and we have one, if you're thinking about that in terms of, of values. And we're going to use this to drive that rotation. Now, let's see what we got here in terms of rotation on this UV transform. Uh, it's expecting a degrees, so 1 is going to probably be 360, and I'm guessing 0.5 will be 180. So let's grab a, another range mapper. So the commander again, range mapper, and let's dump that in here. We're going to grab our color. We probably don't even need to use the range mapper because we've got these values pretty much figured out, but we'll do it anyway. Um, so right now we've got zero and we, zero to one is what we've got and that's totally fine. In fact, we 
totally don't need this range mapper, but we're going to leave it in there just for the heck of it. Let's take a look at that. All right, good. So we've got a good mixture of white, black, and 50% gray. So we know that if we pipe this into the rotation, that it's either going to be not rotated at all, it's going to be 360 degrees, or it's going to be uh, 180. So we might want to change that. We might want to change that, but let's just go ahead and take a look at what it does. Let's dump it into the uh, local rotation. There we go. And let's look at the output of this. And give it a moment. And there we go. Now we're getting completely random rotation based on on these uh, on this on this range mapper and this multi shader, which is a really cool shader. Okay, that is going pretty far. Probably a little bit. Probably going a little bit longer than I even wanted to go. Let's add one more layer of uh, of uniqueness, I guess. And that is going to be using the same technique that we just did, but I'm just going to throw this entire thing into a color corrector. I'm going to do that not by selecting the node commander, which is great. I'm actually going to just right click over this noodle and say insert converter color color correction. All right, it's going to automatically create a color correction for me. So if I wanted to, I could hue shift and we could do all sorts of stuff with value and gamma and uh, well not gamma but value and saturation yada 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 let's reset these back down to their defaults and let's turn off this preview uh, there we go all right so reset okay so i'm going to use random values again to uh drive our our, our color correction which we're just going to tweak probably the hue a little bit to make it a little bit more interesting. Let's grab our multi-shader, select it, copy, paste, and we're going to change. Uh, we're actually just going to leave this as is. I might add a couple different more at different varying values just so we have a little bit more variation. There we go. Okay, so let's take this color and we're going to drive the... Actually, we're going to pipe this into a chain arrange just so I can have more oops more control over exactly what these values are doing uh, boom range mapper cool all right boom this is going to go into a color value okay so now we've taken these values and we're, we're we're mapping them to zero to one uh, which in our case for doing hue is going to be in degrees so we don't want to go that far so I'm going to go like negative point one to point one and let's pipe this directly into the hue and boom into the hue and now we're going to see each one is going to be a little bit different a little hue shift on each one maybe we need to go further what the heck is it doing let's try zero and 0.5 what is that doing that's uh, it's locked up on me here we go solo that one uh, let's see if it's actually working here or maybe those values are absolute in which case I, I can't imagine that would be the case but yep random yep okay so this actually let's just double check we're gonna solo that node Yep, that's doing what I want. Okay, so it looks like it just took a really long time to uh, update, but it did work. Um, okay, so that did work. It just took took a rather long time for it to uh, for it to work. And let's just check the negative levels. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe it can't. I would think it would be able to do it, but maybe not. Yeah. Okay. It did. All right. It works. It just took, it just took a while. Um, okay. So that is another way to sort of create even more randomness. Again, I'm just going to clean this all up. Look at that. Oh man. I love that feature. Can't wait to use this in, in Redshift and Arnold and Octane. Well, not Octane, but these guys be such awesome to just be able to clean that up. Um, so that is um, a few different things that you can do to randomize your stuff. You could also use, if you want to get, I'm not going to do this today. We'll do this in a future video. I need to spend a little bit more time with it, but we could do some really cool stuff with fields where fields are actually affecting which clone is getting which shader, uh, which is really cool if you're trying to really art direct your uh, cloners. 
So there is a ton of really cool new features in the new node-based material editor. We've just begun to scratch the surface. And uh, I think it's, it's on its way to being probably the best node-based material editor I've seen in Cinema 4D. Uh, certainly a huge upgrade for anybody using Espresso uh, or um, just not having it at all, I guess. So it's, it's really great. I've been enjoying using it quite a bit. Now, I promised that I would talk about a few things that I wish were different. Um, and I am going to say that I wish it was a bit faster. You saw a bunch of times during the video, it would lag or it, it sort of took a while for it to update or the previews took a while for it to update. I'm hoping by the time this makes it out that maybe some of those little kinks have been worked out. The other thing that's more of like a quality of life thing uh, that I'm sure they'll add at some point is I'm used to being able to hit control and drag to create a copy of a node, not having to hit control, pay, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. So I'm hoping maybe that's already here and I just don't know about it, but I've not been able to find anything like that. I'm hoping that becomes a thing because I find myself doing that quite a bit when I'm working in nodes. But other than that, I got to say it's fully featured. It looks great. It feels great. It's super easy to connect nodes. It's super easy to find things, easy to navigate. I love how clean it is. The grouping is great. You can really dive deep into stuff. In fact, I'll give you a little tiny taste of what that is. So let's dive into one of their presets, which is going to be the, uh, the car paint. And let's go here to the... Come on, car paint. All right, no editor. There we go. So the car paint is uh, a complex shader that they've built for you. And I forgot to mention this, but you can actually build incredibly complex shaders and publish controls for yourself or for other users. So if you right click this and you say edit asset, you can actually see what they've done to create this material. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure this one might. Yeah, if we do edit resource, I believe. Mm, actually, I don't know if this one is going to be published or oh yeah here we go so this is all of the pieces that someone has made for this car paint and you can do all of this yourself you can create these really complex shaders and publish out the controls so that it just looks to something as simple as uh, let me find where i was um let's see let me get back into it i believe it might be this one right here. So once you've kind of created this in, in, you know, elaborate material, you can publish the controls for the user and uh, it looks just like any other shader, which is great. I actually um, plan on doing a lot of these. Uh, so they are very useful. So you can get really complex if you want. You don't have to if you don't want to. You can use the Uber material, which I should show you really quickly. I'm sure you're all probably like, show us the Uber material. All right, so the Uber material is just as you would expect it. For some reason, it put it way up here. No big deal. Let's go ahead and show all the ports. And you've got everything in here that you're used to seeing in a uh, physical material. You got um, your reflection is no longer called reflectance, which is great. Makes a lot more sense to me. Um, you got your diffuse. You got your coating. It's it's a very useful material. And if any point you want to actually see what's going on under the hood you can actually come in and look at how they built this shader, this Uber material yourself. And you can see they've got some groups here, like this group right here. If we dive into, let's pull this down here. So this is the bump and normal group where they've got all sorts of craziness. Now you can dive as crazy as you want, or you can just work, work with it, you know, like this. It's totally up to you, which is awesome. I love having that ability to dive in deep if I want to dive in deep. Okay, well, I have been talking a really long time. I feel like um, I have given you a pretty good overview of this. We're going to be doing a lot more videos on R20. We're going to do a lot more tutorials. We're going to be at SIGGRAPH talking about it. But I am absolutely uh, in love with the node-based material editor. I'm, I can't wait for it to come over to all the third-party renderers. That is going to be awesome. So um, until next time, uh, I'll see you around. Thanks. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hope you liked what you saw. If you want to see more R20 stuff, head over to grayscalegorilla.com. We've got lots of coverage on R20, new videos coming soon, and also we'll be at SIGGRAPH this year talking about R20 as well. So until next time, I'll see you later.